Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cat Talk Radio. I'm your host, Molly DeVos. And today we have Dr. Brian Hurley with Amerivet Veterinary Partners. You're used to seeing and hearing him on the show. And we're going to talk to Dr. Hurley about hyperthyroidism in cats today. So welcome to the show, Brian. Glad to be back. Yeah, we're glad to have you. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise with us on these episodes. No, it's my pleasure. So hyperthyroidism, it's its something I, I sadly know a little bit about from having a cat with it and fostering cats with it and uh, seeing it uh, fairly often in, in older cats in the shelter. So let's start with, can you help define for everybody what hyperthyroidism in a cat is? Sure. You know, the, the biggest thing is hyperthyroidism is a overproduction of the thyroid hormone. So there's two that we kind of focus on, uh, T3, T4. Really the T4 is the one that you hear doctors uh, talk about the most, you know, in the room when they're thinking about testing for hyperthyroidism. So, but it's, when you get that overproduction of thyroid hormone, it oftentimes results in a enlargement of the thyroid gland itself. And it's something that we can feel on a physical exam uh, just by palpating around, you know, the neck area and kind of rubbing our fingers down kind of the trachea, trachea area. And you'll actually feel that enlargement. Good news is most of those enlargements are kind of non-cancerous or benign in nature. They're more what we refer to as adenomas. Uh, but there are a few that obviously can be cancerous or more of the thyroid adenocarcinomas, which would be more of the malignant phases. But fortunately, that's pretty, uh, you know, that's a, a rarer find than the normal benign. And does that go hand in hand typically with the with the hyperthyroidism where, you, where you're finding an actual physical disfigurement of the thyroid? Typically, yeah, it's just an enlargement. So, okay. you know, thyroid usually adheres fairly closely, but when it enlarges, it just like any enlargement of anything, you can pick that up on a physical exam. Not always. It doesn't, if we don't feel it, doesn't mean that, you know, we don't miss it or depending on the size of the cat, there's other variables that can occur. Uh, blood testing is obviously warranted if you're suspecting it, whether you feel it or not. Uh, to to confirm that's not the end all be all, but it's definitely something that we do look for on physical exam. Now, why is it? I've always wondered. You know, it seems like there's a ep epidemic of hypothyroidism in women in human species, mm -hmm. but you don't see hypothyroid in felines very often. Why? Why is it that most of the time it's hyperthyroid? It's just the nature of how uh, cats' thyroid glands react. We don't see the hypothyroid in cats like we do on humans or dogs. So dogs follow the human side. They get more of the underactive thyroid gland than the overactive thyroid gland, which we see in cats. You know, I always laugh. Cats always need to be different. They need to do something different <laughs> from uh other species just because that's who they are they're cats um, right they're cats but they're special um, <laughs> yeah so we very rarely see it i mean if we see hypothyroid it's usually because we've gotten very aggressive at treating the hyperthyroid oh. uh, component um you know and so and and they're different right because in hypothyroid you you tend to get kind of a uh dog that just wants to lay around all the time kind of in people too you get obesity so you get an increase in in weight and those two things tend to be uh the mainstay and when you treat hypothyroid in dogs or in people uh true hypothyroidism sometimes what you'll notice is all of a sudden their energy le level picks back up their weight starts to decrease because you're correcting the thyroid so it's one of the most common things, even in people, you go, you see an overweight dog or a human doctor sees an overweight person. They go, let's check your thyroid because obviously that can be managed with medication. Yeah. The opposite stands true with hyperthyroidism. In cats, it's kind of the opposite effect. 
they actually start to lose weight because their gland is overactive. And so they're dropping weight. They can become, instead of lethargic or low energy level, they become hyperactive. They're, you know, they're all of a sudden just kind of crazy cat running around the house in spurts. Uh, you know, so you see that. Now you can also see things like an increase in appetite with weight loss, an increase right. in thirst or urination. Again, you start hearing the same symptoms of other disease processes when you start diving deeper. Uh, you can see vomiting, diarrhea as well, kind of their fur becomes greasy or matted or unkempt. They're just not taking care of themselves as well. Other things do that, but hyperthyroid is definitely factored in. And to your point earlier, the older population to middle-aged population is more highly represented than say the younger though. Again, we're you know, you can see it in young cats as well. Yeah. I, I fostered a cat named Parker and uh, he, he was hyperthyroid and had him on the, the medications and whatnot. And he was just that he was ravenously hungry all the time. You could not right. feed this cat enough. And he was thin, thin, thin. And he was the only cat, only cat that I've ever fostered that actually ripped up these leather couches because <laughs> he was always like let's do this let's do that let's do this and right, always right. in my face begging for food and oh my gosh he was high maintenance <laughs> oh yeah no absolutely he was cute and he had one of those great meows one of those rang, rang. <laughs> <laughs> uh... he was he was fun and uh a, a very very hard though so i guess true if your cat is not putting on weight or losing weight and ravenous all the time there could be some signals that it's time for a vet check and and get some blood work done to see right yeah absolutely you know anytime our feline patients are exhibiting anything out of their normal behavior as we've talked about before is a great time to go have the veterinarian, you know, take a peek because most of what we need to do besides the physical exam, which we talked about earlier, we also want to look at the same things, blood work and urine, mainly because with hyperthyroid, the thyroid plays a role in a lot of things in the body anyway. And we want to see what the kidneys are doing because with thyroid disease, you can get uh, high blood pressure or hypertension, which can have an adverse effect on the kidneys. It can also have an adverse effect on the heart where the heart muscles will thicken. I know we talked about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as one cause of thickening heart muscles. Uh, hyperthyroidism can do the same thing. And the good news is that if we find hyperthyroidism by looking at the thyroid levels, and sometimes if the thyroid levels are, the cat is still suspicious of thyroid, we might e even look not only at the T4 result, but there's something called free T4. Difference is one is a bound protein, the other one's unbound. And so sometimes we get even more specific if we're suspecting it, because that free T4 can be elevated as that first evidence that there's something going on. And so we want to look at that because then it makes us want to look at kidney values. It, we may want to take x-rays if we hear something going on with the heart. But with treatment, unlike hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a thickened heart muscle that's going to stay that way, if we correct the thyroid disease, Sometimes we can get resolution of the thickened heart muscles and the kidneys because we're controlling the underlying process. Mm -hmm. Now, how do they get it? Is it how, how does a cat get hyperthyroidism? Like most of our diseases, we we don't truly know exactly what causes it. What we do know is that first of all, if the food contains too much iodine that can create an, you know, create hyperthyroidism. We also know that canned foods 
particularly fish flavors, liver flavors, those type of things can create the potential of hyperthyroidism. So there are studies out there that show it. There's other chemicals that are used in the processing of that can that can create problems. Um, I know you had asked before about, uh, there's a thought that the fire retardants that are used in furnitures and carpeting and things like that, that have, there's studies that show those chemicals can disrupt the thyroid and, and create hyperthyroidism in our cats too. And so all those things are things we need to be cognizant of, but they also talk about dust particles can contain things that can also create issues. I was kind of laughing as I was just kind of doing some refresher on hyperthyroidism that pretty much anything that we do, litter, cat litter, all these things can potentially have things in them that can create hyperthyroidism and they can create other disease processes too. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> you know, it's always tough because what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always joke with my clients, you watch news tonight and tomatoes are great for you. And then the next night you watch another news article and they're showing you how tomatoes are going to kill you. And it's just knowing and being educated and, and understand, particularly when there's such an unknown, just be leery of everything, but you can't become obsessive because there's just, in spite of our, our abilities to try to put kids and dogs and us and our cats in a bubble, just isn't realistic for a very enjoyable life. And so, yeah, uh, but those are the things that have been shown to potentially cause hyperthyroidism in, in, in our cats. And now the iodine, is that listed in an ingredient label? If someone was concerned and wanted to look at the ingredients in their cat food, is iodine listed in there? There, it's tough because there isn't a, you know, based again on what I've read, there isn't a uh, standard amount to post for cats. So they yeah, AFCO to doesn't go on the higher side because there's not a maximum or minimum level to necessarily be met. So that tends to be more of an excess that, that may be in the food. Yeah. So AFCO doesn't require that to be listed out in the, uh, it's not the one that I commonly talk about, even in our, my hyperthyroid cats, I, you know, very rarely in the office started breaking down a food ingredient label, right? <laughs> you know, to start discussing it. I knew we were going to make changes, uh, moving forward. So those were the discussions that we would have. Yeah. So, I mean, just probably do the common sense thing, stay away from fish, which we all know is higher in the iodine and things like that make, make right. sense. And it's particularly canned food where we see more of the issue than dry food. But as we've talked about before, there in cats, we have to balance dry food, water intake, all those things that right. can be a problem because in my cat, I fed strictly dry food which meant his thyroid was going to probably be less affected, but I had to worry about more urinary tract infections right. and urinary tract disease, but he was a great drinker because of the fountain that we had. And, and so again, it's checks and balances, being aware and being very cognizant of how your cat behaves. But that's definitely one thing that we can control, which is, you know, knowing canned food, wet, fish yeah it's the the probability a lot higher so that's an easy one to avoid and you can even there's moist foods that are in pouches which now eliminates the risk of the chemicals that are used to process the can itself yeah yeah pouches are good like i use fresh frozen raw so it's never canned it's you know little frozen nuggets in a bag so right, you take the can out of the equation and you're eliminating quite a few things. Yeah. That's interesting. And then, yeah, I, I remember reading the study where 
I think it was back in the in the 60s when fire retardants, the government made it mandatory that anything that was being imported into our country and sold the, you know, the the textiles on furniture, carpets, blankets, things like that, all had to have fire retardants, which makes sense. You know, if your house right. catches on fire, you don't want to have things that are you know, fueling the the flames, but but because our cats live so close to the floor and so close, you know, their faces are a whole lot closer to that stuff than ours are. But it's right. interesting that that coincided that timeline of when those fire retardants were mandatory also coincided with the spike in hypothyroidism in in humans. So right. I think that's always that's been a, a real theory that that's been a thyroid disruptor in all species. No, absolutely. You know, I think there's things in diets that are disruptors. I think that can be a disruptor. There are pesticides that can be disruptors. All those things have been linked to so many different things. So this is just one more thing to think about. Yeah. Um, but even if we could eliminate all those, you know, we could put them in a bubble and protect them. It still doesn't mean they won't get hyperthyroidism because we don't fully know the exact cause. Right. You know, all these things we know contribute, but we can't definitively say your cat's going to get hyperthyroid because think about the number of cats that eat fish and never develop hyperthyroid. Right, right. <laughs> it, it it does come down to the individual body and how well it, you know, it's able to manage the environment and the food we put into them and all that. Yeah. Now, as far as treatments go, I had my my two biggest experiences with the hyperthyroidism in cats is Parker, who was on the mesanethol. The is that what it's the called? Mm -hmm. and um and so i had to pill him every day which he was pretty easy to pill and then i had another cat named santa fe that ended up with hyperthyroidism and i had it irradiated mm -hmm. and because i i what i understood them to say was that in cats they can actually regenerate healthy thyroid if it's irradiated but what happened there was it uncovered some other underlying issues like some heart issues that weren't detectable because of the hyperthyroidism. So once we got rid of the hyperthyroidism, then, then there were these other heart issues that were all of a sudden there. Right. I mean, and typically with treatment, we would expect kidney issues if, if the treatment of hyperthyroidism helps resolve the hypertension or the high blood pressure or, you know, control some of the, the, the heart disease. So that's the one time where we hope that in controlling the primary disease, these secondary things also resolve. Now, yeah. what could have happened is in the treatment, there was also primary disease here and those became more prevalent because the hyperthyroid was masking. Right you know, those symptoms, but you're absolutely right. So typically the very first thing that we go with is oral medication. We need to start driving the, the numbers down depending on where they're at. And we can see thyroid levels up over 20 in our cats that we need to br bring those levels down before even trying some sometimes ul ul ulterior treatments. So methimazole for the longest time was the drug of choice. It, it was a human drug that we use technically off label because we knew what it did, um, but it wasn't approved for use in cats by the FDA. So we, but we still used it. They now have Philimazole, which is an FDA approved, but I will tell you veterinarians, we carry both yeah. uh, hmm. in, in our practice. Uh, so uh, what's nice with that is if a pet owner can get the medication into them, uh, it's relatively safe, it's inexpensive, and it tends to control the thyroid disease. You do have to monitor, obviously, um, and you have to watch for some side effects like vomiting, diarrhea, going off their food, uh, lethargy. If you see those things, we may have to look at alternatives. Another thing that I used in practice a lot of times, particularly if the levels were 
lower, you know, not up at the 20, uh, was diet. You know, there are diets out there on, on the market that restrict the level of iodine. So without that precursor to make thyroid hormone, uh, the, the level can come down. And so again, imagine now just having to feed a diet to your cat that helps control the disease. As long as they like the diet, pretty, okay. pretty simple, right? Yeah. So that, that was always there. Um, we always talked about long-term restriction of iodine, what effects that could have on the body long-term. I think, you know, YD from Hills is one of the ones first diets to come out. And obviously as time goes on, you know, studies are happening to make sure there's no long-term, you know, side effects and things like that, but it's still a relatively newer diet on the market. You also have surgery, not done as much anymore, but you can go in and you can remove the thyroid gland that solves that issue uh, right away, but it requires anesthesia, a little more risk. You have to spare the parathyroid gland. So if you damage those, that can create issues because the parathyroid helps in controlling our calcium levels in the body. So a little more technical. Uh, and then what you experienced was the gold standard, which is the radioactive um, iodine treatment. Um, nice thing there is a little more expensive in the short term, but 95 to 98% effective at, at curing the thyroid disease. It targets the abnormal cells in the thyroid. And so those, the, the levels come down, uh, they do have to remain hospitalized over a period of time. And you have to be a little careful when you bring them home for that first month just making sure that you're minimizing contact and you're handling the litter a little differently because you are giving them a radioisotope mm -hmm. that uh, can be recorded. And so you just have to be a little leery of that. But again, with the right education, not a big deal. And if they're cured, it's great. There's a small percentage of those cats that may need an additional treatment, uh, which is uh, allowed, you know, you're able to do to try to control the thyroid, but that's kind of the gold standard, but it's also not something that every veterinarian does. You have to be certified to do it because of the uh, radioisotopes that you're using. So there is a certificate program that you have to go through to get certified to be able to do it. Uh, yeah. But it's, but it's out there. There's enough of people out there doing it. And again, it's kind of the gold standard and it does avoid needing oral medication the risk of surgery. And obviously if diet's not controlling it, it's the, the only thing that we have at our disposal. Yeah. There was a center, a specialty treatment center in Dallas that did it. So they did, they did all kinds of specialty mm. cancer treatments and these and things like that. So they, they, the vets all referred to them. So that was somewhat easy to do. Sadly, she didn't live all that much longer um, because of then the heart issues that came on. So was, I felt like it was like, well, that probably wasn't the best investment, but you know, hindsight is always 2020. 20. How do we know? That, that's all, that's the key to everything. Right. And, and what I always strived to educate any pet owner is we can educate and tell you everything that we can do on the pet side because the sky's the limit. You know, we've talked about this before, kidney transplants, all these different things that can be done. It's just understanding the risk benefit and what it is as an owner you want to do. So if somebody does radio, like you did the, the radioisotope and the cat passes, it's okay because I think as a pet owner, you feel you did something to improve the quality. You can't prevent the next thing that impacts them. Right. But I bet you, you tried and some are successful, some aren't. And so it's just knowing that you're making the decision that you're comfortable with for your pet and there is no bad decision. Yeah. And, and pilling is so hard. I mean, the other, mm -hmm. I mean, it's such a, 
and you know, inconvenient disease in a cat because trying to get a pill in a cat is is not easy, you know. And then the cat begins to cats are so smart and they know. Okay, same time every day she comes at me with that pill. I'm gonna just go hide. And then and then they see. I mean, they pick up on the routine so quickly and and begin to avoid. And it's just, it can be a real battle right. trying to get that pill in that little cat's mouth. <laughs> right. And and now there's there's more access to compounding products too. So one of the more common ones that we see used for hyperthyroid is a gel that you put inside the ear. Oh, nice. The transdermal uh, is good. And so the transdermal can be a alternative treatment and has proven to be successful in the majority of our feline patients. Uh, but so that's probably the more common choice. Yeah. You know, that they can compound and chewables and things like that too. So depending on the cat, there might be alternatives. If you don't want to do the surgery, if food's not controlling it, if you don't want it or are unable to do the radioisotope treatment, then, you know, that's something that you can discuss with your veterinarian. I don't think I can pill my cat. What are my alternatives knowing I can't do those other, other ones either? Yeah, now that's great. The I love transdermals. They're so easy because yeah. you can distract <laughs> real easily with, with treats and mm. I like putting the, the lick and lap, the stuff that comes in a tube and I like to just smear it on the counter in a long line. And then while he's busy trying to eat that up, I do transdermals and, you know, flea and tick stuff and all kinds right. of things while he's distracted. So that's good. So what's the prognosis? You know, let's say you got a cat that's been diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. Should you start, you know, making a bucket list of things they love to do? Is this the beginning of the end or is it, is it something that they could live with a normal lifespan? In general, the prognosis is good. You know, yeah. if we can drive those values down, which typically with some form of treatment we can, then we suspect that they're going to live a long, healthy life. They'll be monitoring and we'll be watching for some other things going on in their bodies, but it's no different than uh, doing the annual blood work that we're going to recommend anyway in a healthy pet. So it's, this is one where, no, I don't think it's a bucket list time, you know, death sentence in most instances. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, that's good news. Yeah. That's good news. Cause it's, cool. I think it's always scary to, for a pet parent to hear, you know, your, your cat has hyperthyroidism. <laughs> no, absolutely. And like I said, untreated, that untreated or hyperthyroid with secondary things always the prognosis can change a little bit, but uh, this is one disease process where I feel that most pet owners can find something that will work because of the gels or because of the, some cats are easily pilled like you had the one or the surgery option or the, there's so many different treatments that maybe something will work within their ability to do. Um, yeah. So I like that where yeah. sometimes we're very restrictive and sometimes it's just so costly to treat that in and of itself can be the limiting factor. Yeah. So far as prevention is concerned, if I'm a cat owner and I have a young cat and I want to make sure that it lives a long, healthy life. I mean, obviously don't feed it canned food. Of course, you know me, I wouldn't recommend feeding it dry food either. Right. So I, I would recommend pouch or raw or, you know, a frozen raw or a fresh pet or something like that, that doesn't come in a can stay away from the fish. And of course, if you have the choice, you know, I have concrete floors, so I've eliminated at least fire retardants on my carpets. Right. You know? Um, careful which with textiles that you have and things like that best you can but right and I think what you've done is going to be the standard short of putting them in a bubble and having them live in that you know be cognizant canned foods fish flavors uh, those definitely 
are something that you want to to watch for. You know, I've read if you're going to feed canned food, don't get the big cans. So there's longer contact time, you know, try to open feed and be done with it. Uh, you know, you want to make sure there's plenty of water. And again, there's chemicals in, in water. So making sure there's filtered water can be of help, uh, mm -hmm. just like we would be drinking to, you know, to some degree minimizing contact with your uh so cat litters that use a lot of you know deodorizers and things like that being a leery of those those are all things that have been linked that you can impact the thing i always say is but just because you do that it may not alter the course of the disease process Sure. So I never want somebody to to fearfully go out and go, oh my God, I'm doing all these things and my cat's going to get hyperthyroid because that just isn't the case. This is just like, I think what we do is we educate of things that are out there and things that you can do, but you have to also be leery. If your cat has had a, you know, litter that's had a deodorizer in it and they can smell it. And then you take that away and you, or you change to a, low dust litter, all of a sudden they might start to develop behavior issues because they don't like the litter that you chose. And so are you going to create another problem in trying to prevent one that that may not prevent it anyway? If that makes yeah. sense, it's yeah, it's hard because you know everything when you don't know the exact cause, you just try to minimize. They talk about because there's environmental uh, components. Do you bathe your cat more frequently? Do you wipe them down more frequently because they're licking themselves as they're grooming, which creates issues, but they're still going to do that because you're never going to be able to keep them completely free of dust and debris. And, and so, right. and everywhere think, they walk, they're licking their paws and grooming with their paws. I mean, they're, they're also ingesting everything they step on. Right, exactly. You know, and they talk about, um, you know, like with water, like our cat, we put the tap water, which was filtered into a, a fountain that also had a filter in it. But they say don't do bottled water because there's chemicals in the plastic. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you could go crazy, absolutely yeah. crazy trying to prevent everything. I personally would tell my pet owners, just make those simple things. Don't get lost in the weeds. I filter my dog, my cat water. It's the water I drink. It's right. filtered. So what I did for me is good enough for my pets, right? Um, we have... HEPA filters in our house to try to minimize the dust. Well, that's something you can do to try to prevent hyperthyroid. Mm -hmm. But you're doing that for yourself anyway. <laughs> right. So right. do things that make sense that you would do for yourself and and just be leery about getting caught in the weeds because you could do this with every disease process trying to prevent every single thing. And then something still happens and, and you've spent a lifetime worrying about what you can or can't prevent. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, sure, and, sure. and it's hard, you know, that's, that's what makes these difficult because I never want a, a listener to just run out and start just revamping everything that they're doing because of this conversation. It's more of education and understanding hyperthyroidism, knowing it's a, a disease of, typically our older cats and we really don't know what does it, but here's a few things that you might want to be leery of, which is what I hope they take away. Yeah. Yeah. And it's treatable. It's treatable. It's treatable. That's true. They can it's live, a, you know, they potentially can live a happy, normal life and it won't be hyperthyroid. That is why they eventually pass. Yeah. Yeah. True. Well, good. Anything else we need to know about hyperthyroidism in cats? No, I think we've covered everything. 
and Good. more. <laughs> and more, as always, and more. <laughs> but that's good. I think it's all more information is is better than no information. <laughs> well, it does because I think what's really great about these conversations is if they're ever in the vet's office and all of a sudden they go, I think we need to look at hyperthyroid. At least now they have an understanding of what it is, what the symptoms are that the vet is being alerted to. And if there aren't any overt symptoms that they've noticed, they'll know that when they see the vet do this and then immediately starts to talk about thyroid, they'll know. Yeah. And then they'll already have a little idea of the treatment option. So it's not going to come as a complete surprise because let's face it, when you're in the doctor and they throw out a term or a phrase or an illness that you weren't even thinking immediately panic sets in and you don't hear anything else. And I think today we dispelled that this is not something that you go, Oh my God, my cat's going to, to die from this disease. You can actually now listen and, and work with the veterinarian to pick the best course of action. Yeah, it is manageable. And that's, and that's good. I mean, even, even as a foster, you know, I, I don't hesitate to foster hyperthyroid cats and it's, I'm pretty good at pilling and don't have yeah. to worry about it. But now that I know there's transdermals, I'm going to push for that. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's all good. <laughs> That's good. Well, thank you again for being with us today. No, oh, you're very welcome. I always enjoy our, our time together. Yeah. And thank you for tuning in to Cat Talk Radio. And until next time, keep calm and purr on.